Oh, hi there. On October 15, 1997, in a coordinated effort between NASA, the European Space Agency, and the Italian Space Agency, launched the Cassini-Huygens spacecraft. After seven years, four billion miles, a flyby of Venus and Jupiter, in 2004, the craft reached its final destination, Saturn. From here, the Huygens landed on Saturn's largest moon, Titan and the Cassini probe entered Saturn's orbit, where it would remain for 13 years, concluding its mission in 2017. Described as a mission of firsts, the repercussions of this journey are vast. The first craft to land in our outer solar system, the first close-up images of Saturn's other moons, along with discovering new moons that we didn't know about, the first discovery of lakes on a planet outside of Earth, witnessing Saturn's brutal weather patterns, and giving a deeper understanding of the planet's iconic rings. To this very day, the images and data transmitted from the Cassini-Huygens mission is still being poured over and analyzed, giving us new insight to our galaxy. But out of these monumental discoveries came something that no one could have seen coming. A mysterious film would be brought into our mortal plane, perhaps a curse by Saturn herself. A film commissioned by NASA, funded by the Taiwanese government, featuring the most amazing voice cast of any piece of lost media in existence. A film so heinous that almost no one saw it until now. This is the search for Quantum Quest, a Cassini space odyssey. In anticipation of this mission of firsts, NASA commissioned a film to be made about the voyage, envisioning an educational documentary about the journey to Saturn and its findings, the kind of thing you'd see in class or at a school field trip. But when NASA approached Harry, Doc Clore, to helm the movie, he had a different vision. Doc had always dreamt of a film combining the fun of a family-friendly animated romp with real-world science. He was able to sell NASA on his vision, becoming writer, producer, and director of what was then called 2004 A Light Night's Odyssey, the first CGI animated sci-fi film based on a real, ongoing space mission. Now, NASA was not interested in Doc for his filmmaking experience, or lack thereof. He had only written a few episodes of Star Trek Voyager, Earth Final Conflict, and some educational shorts. No, they wanted Doc for his unparalleled scientific knowledge. Doc is in no uncertain terms a genius. He taught university science classes as an undergrad, was commissioned by the National Engineering Society to make commercials, has founded an obscene number of successful businesses in the fields of scientific consulting, education, and stem cell research. He's on the board of DARPA's 100-Year Starship Study, a program to fund science that will help us travel outside our solar system in the next 100 years. Maybe most impressively of all, according to the U.S. Council of Graduate Schools, Dr. Harry Clore is the only person in history to earn two PhDs at the same time, one in physics and one in chemistry. If you didn't get the point, dude's legit. Harry was given $100,000 by NASA to fund his dream film, and development started as early as 1996, before Cassini had even launched. In addition to being an absolute genius, Doc must have been rolling straight D20 speech checks, because using the same charm that got NASA to support his film, he was able to convince an all-star cast of celebrities to get on board by, get this, just asking them real nicely. Seriously. He personally called up A-list celebrities, threw NASA's name around, and told them it was for children's education. Harry Doc Clure secured a 90s dream team. We're talking John Travolta, Sarah Michelle Gellar, Michael York, David Warner, Christian Slater, Robert Ricardo, James Earl Jones, Samuel L. Jackson, and Casey Kasem. Not only did they all sign on for the movie, but agreed to be paid the Screen Actor Guild minimum, the lowest amount they could be paid and still be part of their union, coming out to just hundreds of dollars for actors that could have asked for millions. The voiceovers were in progress and everything was going smoothly, and a good chunk of the dialogue was recorded, but Doc would get a phone call from NASA that presented the film's first major setback. They asked if he could postpone the movie by a decade. They wanted the movie to include pictures of Saturn and have the movie end with footage of Cassini's flyby over Titan that wouldn't even be taken until the mid to late 2000s. Doc agreed. I mean, what are you going to do? Say no to NASA? The movie was put on ice. During this gap, the movie's name was changed to what we know today, Quantum Quest, a Cassini space odyssey. And an additional director is brought on, Dan St. Pierre, an animation veteran who'd worked on Disney classics like Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, The Lion King, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, and projects with DreamWorks like Shark's Tale and Shrek 2. 
In 2007, as NASA was processing the images and data from the Cassini-Huygens voyage, Doc had secured Taiwanese-based animation studio Digimax to do the CGI work and finance Quantum Quest to the tune of between 10 to 12 million dollars. The only catch? Digimax had never made a movie before, and as it turns out, they never would again. It's not fully understood why, but the movie wasn't financed by Digimax themselves, but by the Taiwanese government. It's believed that Taiwan was bankrolling the studio in hopes of transforming Taiwan into an animation powerhouse. It's claimed that Quantum Quest would mark the country's first feature film with an all-star voice cast. The following year, the movie hit another major complication, one that I don't fully understand. In 2008, NASA released all the image and radar data from the Cassini voyage that the movie needed to continue, but somehow this new information meant that the movie had to be rewritten, thus requiring the voice actors to return for reshoots. I'm not sure what they found that they didn't expect going into it, and how this would change the plot so drastically, but by this time, the cast didn't want to or couldn't return for the movie, so a new cast was brought on. Somehow even more impressive than the first. I'm talking a real who's who of nerd culture. Retaining Samuel L. Jackson, Robert Ricardo, Casey Kasem, and James Earl Jones, while adding other Star Trek alumni like William Shatner, Brett Spiner, Herbert Jefferson Jr., Gary Graham, Doug Jones, and Chris Pine, along with other huge names like Mark Hamill, Amanda Peet, Hayden Christensen, Sandra Oh, Jason Alexander, SpongeBob voice actor Tom Kenny, Little Miss Sunshine, Abigail Breslin, and her brother Spencer Breslin, and the host of Double Dare 2000, Jason Harris Katz, for some reason. And if this wasn't already enough, Quantum Quest would be the first and only film role of the first man to walk on the moon, Neil Armstrong. Somehow, this is not the end of the major contributions. The film's entire sound design was done at Skywalker Studios, and the soundtrack was recorded by the Skywalker Symphony Orchestra. The cherry on top, the movie somehow featured a song by John Roy Anderson, the co-founder and former lead singer of the band Yes, that based on the Quantum Quest website, is called Sing. I went through his entire discography and couldn't find any song just called Sing, but there were songs with Sing in the title so I think this might be an original song written for the movie, or it's just a mistake. Which I wouldn't be too surprised about given the history of this movie. <laughs> With the squad assembled, the script rewritten, the world's best sound studio booked, possibly an original song, and Cassini images in hand, Quantum Quest was in full swing. The group, alongside some of the Star Trek voice actors, appeared at a Comic-Con panel in both 2008 and 2009 with disastrous results, being called a train wreck. But Doc's dream project, Taiwan's first big movie, and the culmination of decades of NASA achievements representing billions of dollars in investment, finally premiered at the Click Amsterdam Animation Festival in September 2010 as a 45-minute film beginning the movie's film festival tour, where it somehow won a few awards at the LA Movie Awards, Accolade Competition, Telly Awards, and the World Chinese Science Fiction Association. Quantum Quest would be commercially released for the first time in late 2010 at select IMAX theaters in Asia. And its entire domestic release consisted of being shown on one screen at the Kentucky Science Center for six months, from January to June of 2011. And that's it. Quantum Quest was never heard from again falling into obscurity, and being deemed lost. But why? What happened? Well, if we go back through the film's website and promotional materials, we get some clues. Dave, that's our plan to destroy the city. Dave, the antenna is at 85% of the Earthlings must not discover Titan's secrets. Launch it all! I'm going to assume some of this animation is unfinished, but the sound quality is atrocious. Who mixed this? Like, what is going on with Mark Hamill and Samuel L. Jackson's voice? How was this edited at Skywalker Studios? The website is surprisingly well-preserved, given that the movie is abandoned. But through this website, we can find some really strange cast interviews. Samuel L. Jackson seems bored out of his mind. James Earl Jones rambles about everything but the movie. And Chris Pine hopes that kids will wear a Dave the Photon costume for Halloween. And they ask Abigail Breslin what kind of ringtone she would be. N not her favorite ringtone or ideal ringtone. If she was a ringtone, what would she sound like? Just bizarre. Was this the result of Dr. Harry Kluwer's inexperience? The inexperience of Digimax? How does a $12 million movie commissioned by NASA that's somehow only 45 minutes long, made by an animation expert and a guy with two PhDs, get a domestic release consisting of one single theater 10 years ago, end up this bad, and just disappear? These questions were asked by Spencer Worth Davis and the Finding Quantum Quest podcast.
At the height of lockdown, Spencer heard about the movie Quantum Quest on Reddit, beginning an obsession and epic quest to find the lost movie. Spencer reached out to individuals attached to the film, but most of whom had never even seen it. And according to interviews with Samuel L. Jackson, he has absolutely no recollection that he ever did this movie, despite being one of the few actors to voice both versions. Spencer found that the $100,000 given to Doc came specifically from JPL, NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So he scoured JPL's archives, finding no public record that they were involved with the movie. And when inquiring further, he was told that the records were destroyed which is pretty strange for an organization like NASA. Through some more digging, Spencer discovered that legendary NASA scientist Charles Colhays was brought out of retirement to consult on Quantum Quest. It is hard to overstate how important this man is to space exploration. He's one of the most revered in his field, awarded NASA's highest honor, and is referred to as the Michael Jordan of NASA. And Spencer found his number to call about an animated movie he worked on 15 years ago. He gave Charles Colhase a call and he actually answered. Spencer explained the situation, the lost movie, and his search, asking if he knew any more details. Charles responded by hanging up. Minutes later, he calls back, apologizes for hanging up, and says that the movie is a sensitive subject for him. Quote, The movie had a lot of issues. Some of them affected people's jobs. It's something I'd hope to forget about. I don't really want to go back to that time period. Now, this guy has been through so much. I don't mean to drag the guy, but Charles Colhase had to work alongside former Nazi scientists who were hired by NASA. But something happened with this children's animated film that shook him to his core. Upon returning to JPL's archives to look for how Charles was involved in the movie, Spencer found the archives deleted. Bookmarked pages now appeared as 404 messages, giving a rather ominous air to the whole investigation. But all of Spencer's research was about to pay off. He found an email for Dr. Harry Kluwer, and within 30 minutes, Harry responded with his phone number and told Spencer to give him a call. Spencer was about to find out that the truth behind Quantum Quest is even crazier than you can imagine. He discovered that there were meant to be two versions of the movie. Both Clure and Dan St. Pierre signed on for a feature length movie around 100 minutes and a 45 minute cut for IMAX theaters geared towards science museums. But something happened that neither Doc nor St. Pierre can fully explain. One day, Digimax said they could no longer fund a 100 minute feature length film. They only had enough money for 40 minutes. The most likely theory is that in 2008, a new president was elected in Taiwan who might have cut funding to the animation studio. But even this is just an educated guess. But whatever the reason, Clore and St. Pierre were forced to condense their 100 minute space epic into 40 minutes. Despite having recorded voiceovers and completed the animatics for a 100 minute cut, editing then became the biggest part of the job. As previously stated, sound design was done at Skywalker Studios, but even with the best voice actors and audio engineers in the business, the inexperience of Digimax was pervasive. The movie looked terrible. And when it came time to market their shortened version of Quantum Quest, they were only given a fraction of what they expected for a marketing budget. They basically had to market it all on their own. Doc managed to get the movie screened to industry professionals in hopes of getting a science center to pick it up. But you might be noticing a trend here. It didn't go well. The museum were looking for standard educational documentaries, which Quantum Quest was not. This put the movie in an awkward limbo, where it wasn't science enough for the science museum, but not long enough to be shown in actual theaters. They wanted a movie with more science, less fiction. Just by chance, Quantum Quest was picked up by one single theater, the Kentucky Science Center, who were holding an exhibit on the science of Star Trek and chose Quantum Quest because it had so many Star Trek voice actors. The film's insane cast ended up being its saving grace. And Quantum Quest, a Cassini space odyssey, was screened daily for six months. Looking at this story, it was clear that Digimax were in over their heads. They would never make another film. Dan St. Pierre would direct one more movie, and Doc has since mostly stuck to science. The movie was forgotten. By the time Spencer and Finding Quantum Quest reached out to Doc, it was the first time anyone had brought up the movie to him in 10 years. Doc was able to dig up a copy of the movie, and in April of 2022, during a Zoom call, screened Quantum Quest to the small search team that had sought after it so desperately. They described it, as one of the strangest movies I've ever seen.
It turns out the sound quality is great. The trailer that Digimax made was only released in 2012, well after the movie had been abandoned. Skywalker Studios edited the sound for both a feature length film and a shorter IMAX version. It's theorized that Digimax took the audio from the IMAX version, put it into a single channel, and used it for the trailer. Because of the efforts of Spencer Worth Davis and Finding Quantum Quest, Giant Pictures released Quantum Quest, a Cassini Space Odyssey on May 10th, 2022 marking the end of a saga, decades in the making. And after refreshing my browser at midnight on the 10th, I finally was able to sit down and watch this movie. And it is rough, but not nearly as bad as I expected. I thought it would be as horrendous as Food Fight, but Quantum Quest has some real potential. Obviously, the voice acting is phenomenal. Samuel L. Jackson and Chris Pine in particular just knock it out of the park. The script is lacking, and it would still have issues in a 100-minute version. Most of this comes from clunky dialogue, poor exposition, and unclear character motivations. But some parts were really well put together. There's an early scene in the movie that's kind of a blitzball lacrosse game. I was really confused why they included this scene if they had to cut the movie by 50 minutes. But it actually comes back at the end of the movie in a really sad satisfying way, along with other characters we've seen throughout the movie coming to help in the final battle. In general, there are some really great visual ideas, but the animation was just executed so poorly. There's one part where an object just clips through Dave, and some sections that are obviously incomplete. There's one scene that was shown in the trailer that I expected to be fixed in the movie, but it was not. It looks terrible. And it turns out the song by John Anderson is actually called Sing To Me, and not an original song for the movie. But it's kind of funny, it's one of two songs that were made public from an unreleased album of his. But I really think the biggest issue with Quantum Quest is that it's so hard to distinguish where the science begins and the fiction ends. Because I did so much research for this movie, I could usually tell what was real and what was fake. But this movie is geared towards kids. How are they supposed to know that Dave the Photon represents a real world scientific thing, but space lizards and dinosaurs on Saturn don't? And I really think that in the end, this is the movie's downfall. It did inject science, it did have what I assume are accurate representations of different planets, and it celebrated the Cassini-Huygens mission. But in no way would I consider this an educational film. Both Doc and Dan St. Pierre have expressed interest in fixing Quantum Quest, a Cassini space odyssey. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked this, you might like my video on Food Fight, the lost movie that still got made. Shout out to my top tier Patreon supporters, Odesta Honeycrisp, MD the Dude, Miss Dana, and the Glumpiest of Glumps. Thank you. This is Mike with All Things Lost. See you soon.